Welcome to our fifth part of the Psychoacoustics lecture. This time we're talking about pitch and pitch strength. Pitch might be familiar to most of you, might be even something that drives you into acoustics uh, because it's related to music. Pitch is the different pitch height that we can produce when we sing melodies and it's that quality that lets us arrange um, the, the sounds on the scale from high to low uh, when we sing melodies. Now that discriminates pitch from timbre, where timbre is uh, the quality of the sound, um, of sounds that are equally loud and have the same pitch, like sounds that are produced by different instruments that are equally loud and have the same pitch, but they still sound different. And that difference is what we term timbre. If we talk about pitch, we have to talk about frequency, frequency of tones. And we'll start at the very uh, rock bottom by just looking into the most uh, smallest changes that we can just hear in terms of a frequency of a tone. So imagine we play one tone and then we play an uh, another tone uh, with a different frequency and we ask somebody whether they heard the difference. That gives us the just noticeable changes of the frequency of tones, which is basically a pitch change. So if we can hear the pitch change by just a little bit, then we have this J and D, which is plotted here in this graph. And you see uh, that it can be very small for a frequency of about a thousand hertz, we see a J and D of only two hertz. So imagine that within a second you have only two cycles more uh, with a thousand and two hertz than with a thousand hertz and people can detect that difference. So the brain is able to just detect the di difference in pitch just from those little two cycles more in a second. That's an amazing feature. We're extremely sensitive to pitch changes. That helps us very much in uh, complex listening situations with multiple sounds to hear out different uh, sounds. It's one of the strongest segregation cues. Pitch J and D increases towards higher frequency. Uh, one of the more or less upper limits is given by uh, being 0.7% of the frequency, uh, which is a very, very small fraction of the frequency. So for larger frequencies, it increases, but it still stays very, very small as a fraction of the center frequency. Pitch uh, J and Ds, uh, pitch perception per C, um, critical bands, uh, and the position of the basilar membrane are all related uh, quantities, um, they all come from how the brain, um, the anatomy of the ear, uh, divides uh, critical bands on the basilar membrane. I also brought you a little demonstration uh, for the pitch J and D. I bring you a tone of a thousand hertz and a tone of a thousand and five hertz. And you see that this tone here depicted as a dot in the graph is just within the error bars. So some of you might hear them identical in pitch and some of you might already hear them being different in pitch. So for me, I hear just a slight pitch change. It's just above my threshold, above my J and D. And of course, it has to do a little bit with training as well. We do a lot of psychoacoustic experiments. So we're used to listening to sounds. If you're a musician, you might well be able to hear those differences as well. Pitch is not set in stone. It's not just directly the frequency. It depends on a number of parameters. And uh, that's what I want to teach you with the following slides, which I find interesting because pitch changes with a level. If we have a low frequency tone of 200 hertz and we increase its level, then pitch changes downwards by up to 2%, which is quite pronounced. On the other hand, if we have a high frequency tone and we increase the level, then pitch shifts upwards. So pitch gets higher at the higher level. And again, you can listen to that and I made an audio demonstration for you 
with a 6 kHz tone that's played first and then played again with an extra 40 decibels. So be sure to ma don't make the first tone too loud, because otherwise 40 dB more is quite a bit. You may want to listen to those demonstrations here via headphones to really hear the differences clearly. So first a 6 kHz tone with uh, whatever loudness that is for you, how much you turn up the volume, and then uh, an additional 40 decibels on that tone. And I don't know how you perceive this, I perceive the louder one to be just a little bit higher in pitch, as the picture also says. But yeah, be aware of the error bars, they're quite large, so that might not be identical for everybody here. There's another aspect in how pitch changes, namely it changes quite dramatically due to partial masking. We've already talked about masking, uh, where we have our probe in the upper flank of the mask here we talked about the upward spread of masking and uh, this is what's being uh, plotted here the pitch change in that situation where we have partial masking on the upper flank of the mask here. now these are not the thresholds we're above threshold the probe is clearly audible but it changes in pitch now imagine here the abscissa the abscissa at minus infinity means that the target level is stands out, the probe stands out, um, there is uh, no masker present, we just have unimpaired pitch as our reference condition. If we then introduce the masker and increase the level of the master step by step, partial masking of the probe will kick in and eventually the probe will be more and more partially masked, will be more and more on the upward upper flank and upward spread of masking and with that occurring the pitch shift also takes place and that's particularly pronounced for low frequency tones um, here the relationship is that the masker is an octave below the target so if we look at the red curve for 200 hertz we have a masker of 100 hertz and if we turn that up if both of them have the same level or if the mask then has 10 dB more uh, than the target, then we see quite pronounced shifts of up to 4%. If we look at the 300 Hz curve, it's even more pronounced. We see pitch shifts up to 8%. This is really massive. Um, likewise, the same occurs if the masking situation is the other way around. So if the probe is below the mask in frequency, uh, then the probe is shift downwards in pitch. So the frequency is always the same, but the perceived pitch is what is being changed. So again, psychoacoustics as being the translation from physics, in this case frequency, to how we perceive it, uh, which is the pitch. So far, we talked about the pitch of single spectral lines, of single tones, and musical instruments, we of course have harmonic complex tones, where there are multiple harmonics related to a fundamental frequency F0. And those harmonics are multiples of that F0, so they're twice the fundamental frequency, three times the fundamental frequency, and so on. Now, in many technical systems and also in many musical instruments, the fundamental itself is not very strong, is not very pronounced, or it doesn't even get transmitted as it is in the telephone. Nevertheless, we can hear the pitch and we can hear the pitch and relate it to F0 or maybe with an octave confusion to twice F0, but it's still uh, related to that F0 pitch. Even though there is no energy present at F0. And we call this virtual pitch or residual pitch. And there are models for this. There's been a lot of research on this because this is quite an interesting phenomenon because it really makes out, uh, differentiates us from being sensitive to frequency and to energy at this particular frequency. Um, we can still hear the pitch without the energy being present at that frequency. And I want to demonstrate that to you as well. I brought a harmonic complex tone belonging to a fundamental frequency of 150 Hz. 
I bring in 50 harmonics, so it goes up to 50 times 150 hertz. And I first play all of those 50 harmonics. And then I take away the first, the lowest one, the fundamental frequency. Uh, then I take uh, away the fundamental and the second, uh, so 300 hertz in this case, uh, and then the 450 and so on. So all the way up to removing the lowest nine harmonics. So you have the residual upper harmonics to harmonic complex tones uh, of 150 hertz fundamental frequency. And you will hear that timbre changes, but nevertheless the pitch, if you were sing to it, will still sound the same. In all of those cases I hear this low frequency merp in there as well. Um, despite it sounding quite nasal and, and different, um, I still get the pitch perception of that low frequency tone. Now another aspect where we would think that there might not be pitch present are noises. So far we concentrate on the pitch based on tones, meaning on single individual spectral lines, may them be individually present or in a harmonic complex tones. Nevertheless, even noises which are just stochastic, which don't have dedicated spectral lines, um, can evoke a pitch. And that's quite interesting and one would not uh, deem this possible. Now, we start off with a noise that has a very, very narrow band. And if noises are narrow in their bandwidth, um, they still have a spectral density and energy across all frequencies in that bandwidth. But nevertheless, we assign it a pitch that corresponds to somewhere near the center frequency uh, of that narrow band of noise. If we now increase the bandwidth of that noise, then eventually, beyond the critical band about, we'll start to hear two pitches. So you can concentrate on a low frequency pitch and on a high frequency pitch. And these belong to the corner frequencies of that noise. So if there's this contrast in, in the energy spectrum um, on that corner frequency, we will hear a pitch. And again, I brought a demonstration on that. And before I bring that to you, I want to introduce the concept of pitch strength to you. Because with noises, the pitch is not as pronounced, not as strong, not as a clear percept as it is with tones. With noises, we often have a pitch somewhere faintly within that noise. So a whistling pitch or so, which isn't as clear and strong. And that's a pitch strength. And that's a very important quality uh, of sounds. So think about fan noises in your computer, for example. If they're just a noise in the background, you might be able to tolerate it. But if it's feeping, if it's uh, pitchy, uh, permanently, then it might be quite annoying. So now to our audio demonstration, I first play a wide band of noise to you, 100 hertz to 10 kilohertz, and it will sound just like noise, so it will not have a, a pitchy quality. But if we, I reduce the bandwidth to just 30 hertz, it's still a noise, but it sounds almost like a tone. It fluctuates a little bit. At 60 hertz, it fluctuates a bit faster. Um, and you will still hear a clear pitch quality to it. If I then increase the bandwidth further to a critical band or beyond the critical band, a few hundred hertz, you will eventually be able to hear a low frequency corner pitch and a high frequency corner pitch. And in the end, I play the full bandwidth noise again. So I think the change in, in, in quality and the change in pitch strength uh, and pitchiness is very clearly audible. The center frequency was always a kilohertz. 
Now this brings us to sum up our short lecture uh, on pitch. First we talked a bit by tonal components, by spectral components, and where we for single tones found a just noticeable difference that is about 0.7% of the frequency of the tone. We looked into pitch that's not only directly correlated with the frequency but also with level pitch changes with level if level increases low frequency tones might be perceived as lower in pitch and high frequency tones as higher in pitch and even more so if there are situations of partial masking pitch shifts can be quite pronounced uh, in the region of several percent of uh, the pitch Virtual pitch is another interesting aspect. Uh, we get a pitch sensation without having energy at the fundamental frequency or even multiples of the fundamental frequencies is enough to have some of the upper harmonics within a certain region, within certain limits to perceive pitch. And that's been used in many um, audio systems um, look into the telephone, for example, where we start to transmit only uh, sounds from a few hundred hertz upwards, while a fundamental frequency of male speech is about a hundred hertz. We then looked into the aspects of pitch strength and the pitch of noise, where we have very narrow bands of noise, which clearly evoke a strong pitch perception. If the bandwidth gets wider, then eventually we get a pitch perception that's somewhere around the corner frequencies. We might be able to perceive two pitches, depending all on the bandwidth. And if the noise gets wider and wider in bandwidth, and if there are no clear uh, spectral peaks in the noise, then uh, the pitch strength, uh, the strength of that pitchiness uh, is a bit lower and can even then disappear uh, compared to the pitch strength of tones. This concludes the introductory overview that I gave you on pitch. There's a bit more material to read up on it. And I'm looking forward to having you in my next courses here in Psychoacoustics Lecture and the TU9 MOOC. Thanks for listening. And thanks for your interest. Bye-bye.